Okay, maybe just 30 seconds more to let a few people trickle in. The rate is still pretty high. Okay, Sylvia, are you ready? I'll, I'll introduce you, I just wanna make sure you're ready. No, I said I was ready and then realized I was muted, so. Oh, okay, great. All right, go ahead, Monsi. Okay, okay, welcome to the Astronomy Colloquium, everybody. Our speaker today is Sylvia Tunin from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Sylvia works in a variety of topics related to binary stars and evolution and compact objects and transients that they form. Uh, as you can see from her logo in the middle of the screen right there, with, you can see the two, uh, the Roche geometry in the middle with the two O's in her name, which I thought was super clever. It's the coolest logo I've ever seen for an astronomer. Um, Sylvia did her PhD at Radboud University with Paul Hroot and Heisen Nelemans, uh, then went on to postdocs at University of Amsterdam in Leiden, hopped across the English Channel over to Birmingham for, as a lecturer for a couple of years and then hopped back across the channel and has just started a faculty position at University of Amsterdam. And we were supposed to have Sylvia coming to Southern California this spring, I believe, for a, a workshop at KITP which I was also supposed to go to, but of course is now canceled. So instead we're gonna to have to settle for a virtual tour. I think you actually just gave a colloquium at Carnegie last week, right? Uh, Carnegie is a little bit longer ago, but Monday I was oh, in there. Okay. And so we're lucky to have her here giving a colloquium today. So take it away, Sylvia. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jim, for the introduction and also for the invitation. And so uh, today I want to tell you a little bit about our work, of course, uh, which is on the topic of stellar interactions and transients. And let's see if I can go to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. And so how I wanted to start my talk was at the end. So I'm going to start with a summary of what I'm trying to show today. And this is going to be a very, very basic summary. So what I want to show is that these kind of systems where we have two stars in orbit around one another, they're common. The stars in them, they evolve, they interact, and every now and then give rise to one of these bright transients that we love and observe. But besides these kind of systems, we also have plenty of these systems. So this is where we have three stars in orbit around one another. And the thing is that triple evolution has been investigated for a number of specific cases, but an overall picture of triple evolution is still missing. And that's something that my group is trying to, to change. We know that that outer star has or can have a very strong effect on the evolution of that inner binary. But I wanna know how that, that happens and when does it happen? And for how many triples is that third star really, really important. So the evolution of these systems is linked to a variety of different outcomes. One of them is stellar mergers, collisions, gravitational wave sources, and through that also the formation of heavy elements. And the number and, well not the number, but the diversity of supernovae and the types of supernovae are also affected by the interactions in these systems. I think for exoplanets, this is also a very interesting field. For example, we know about uh, a small sample of circumbinary planets. And I think this, these triples are also interesting in the context of accretion physics, because many of the sources that are interacting can be formed that way through triple evolution. So the main point that we're trying to answer is how important are triples and how do they really evolve differently from binaries. Now, 
I was talking about all these different kinds of, uh, of outcomes, right? And they are very often linked to these bright transients, right? The explosive ends of, uh, of stellar lives. And I think especially to this audience, I don't have to say much about this amazing era that we're in, where the numbers of observation of these sources are just going you know, through the roof. I think for me, it's still amazing the number of supernovae that ZDF is observing every night. And then with LSST or the Vera Rubin uh, Observatory, when this is going to go up to three orders of magnitude, it's just insane for me. So one of the big questions here for me is what the origins are of many of these transients. Cynthia, you accidentally muted, I think. That is very weird. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> not really sure where I got muted. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just say that um, one of the very puzzling questions for me is what the origins are of these transients. And for many of the transients, we're still fighting and discussing over which types of stars are even involved uh, in the process that leads to that uh, transient. And for some other sources, like the gravitational wave sources, you know, we have a good handle on what types of stars are involved, right? Which black holes, neutron stars, which masses. But we're still working hard on trying to figure out how we can get those stars so close to each other that they can lead to these uh, bright transients. Now, for me, um, the next step is focusing on the origin of these transients but also focusing on um, very novel evolutionary channels. And you know, some of these channels that I'm gonna show, they might sound rare or they might sound uh, very exotic, but I think now is the best time to start studying those. And the reason is that these number of transients, as you all know, are going to go up by so much that even the transients that sound very rare these days will not be rare anymore in a couple of years. And therefore, I think it's time that we, from the theoretical side, also start looking into these, uh, these formation mechanisms that sound, you know, maybe a bit exotic now, but if the number of trenches are going to go up by one to a three orders of magnitude, then these will be uh, trenches that we're going to see. So, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So what I wanna show today uh, consists of two parts. So the first part will be about just the evolution of triples and how they evolve differently from binaries. And then the second part, I'm gonna link it back to, uh, to the transients that they can give rise to. So yeah, let's start with the triple evolution. So I said in the beginning that triples are common, right? But let me quantify that a little bit. So in this plot here, I'm showing the binary fraction as a function of spectral type. And to be exact, the binary fraction here, I mean the fraction of systems that has at least two stars. And this is for young systems and it's uh, based on observations, right? So it's a, it's a measured value. And for uh, solar type stars, the binary fraction is roughly 50%, 40-50%. If we go to more massive stars, we know that the binary fraction goes up. Right? So if we go to O and B type stars, the binary fraction is as high as 70%. It might even be as high as 100%. Now the question is, how does this look like for triples? Now for solar type stars, we have a really good measurement. This is uh, based on the catalog from Andre Tocovini. And the triple fraction for solar type stars is about 10 to 15%. So 10 to 50% doesn't sound super high, right? It's still a lot of sources if we're talking about large catalogs. But if you put it in context with the binaries, then it means that for every five binaries, one of them has a third companion, right? So that in those numbers, it's, it's really not so little anymore. Now, if we go to more massive stars, we don't have a very good uh, measured uh, value of the triple fraction, but we do have a lower limit. And this lower limit is 30%. And I'm calling it a lower limit because 
this number is not corrected for selection effects. You can imagine that there is all lots of selection effects against, um, you know, finding companions if they're dim or if they're, um, you know, not in, uh, in an ideal orbital separation where, uh, you know, our sensitivity is, uh, is not so good. And if you have two stars, two companions that you're looking for, those selection effects are even are just stronger. So this 30% if very easily could, you know, very reasonable would be 50%. There is uh, one study from Max Moll where they try to take into account the selection effects. And in his model, um, the fraction of triples and quadruples becomes so high that it's actually the dominant way of massive stars to be. So in his model, binaries, so stars with really, systems with really just two stars, they are the exceptions. And triples and quadruples and higher order multiples, they are actually the norm for massive stars. And I think that's very interesting for you know, all the things that massive stars can do, like core collapse supernovae and gravitational wave sources. Now, the type of triples that I'll be talking about today, they look like this. So I'm talking about two stars that are in an orbit around one another. And then a third star that's in a much wider orbit going around the center of mass of that inner binary. So these systems we can approximate with an inner binary and an outer binary, an inner orbit, an outer orbit, an inner period, and an outer period. So those are terms you're going to hear me uh, talking about. And these kind of systems that are hierarchical, they can be stable for giga years. They can be stable for, for Hubble times. Now, if we want to understand the evolution, the evolution of these sources, it turns out that we need three ingredients. The first ingredient is three body dynamics. So three body dynamics is something that many of us have seen in our undergrads. And you might remember that we don't have a general solution to the three body problem. So instead what we have is approximations that are valid in parts of parameter space. And I really want to give a lot of credit to this field because in the last decade or so, there's been really a tremendous amount of progress to understand all the weird behaviors that can happen in these multiple body systems. Now, most studies so far have assumed that the bodies of those three body systems, that they are point particles, which makes absolute sense, right? That's how you're going to start if you want to study the dynamics. But you can also understand that you know, if we're talking about stellar triples, that at some point, that's not a good approximation anymore. So we also need to take into account stellar evolution and dissipative processes. So for stellar evolution, I'm thinking about, you know, the fact that stars lose mass in their winds, the fact that radii of stars grow as stars get older. And for dissipation, I'm thinking of, you know, uh, tides, uh, Jim probably uh, will very much agree with me that I should take that into account. And, you know, gravitational waves that also drain energy and angular momentum from, uh, from the triple. Now, so far, there's been a handful of papers that looked at the combination of these three processes. Most studies focused either on three body dynamics and ignored the other two processes or vice versa. And these few papers that looked at this combination, they show that it's a very rich regime that opens up a lot of new evolutionary channels. And we need to investigate this combination better. I developed a code called TRES. Um, I actually forgot to add on this slide that the code is now public. We have a GitHub and the link to that is on the last slide of, of today, so stay tuned. Um, but yeah, so uh, we now have a code that we can use to simulate the evolution of these systems consistently, taking into account these three processes or these three aspects. And today I'm going to show you some of the outcomes that we have, um, that we've got some of the results that we got with TRESS. Before I do that though, I have a couple of more slides on the side of the three body dynamics because I want to give you a bit more of a feeling of what I'm talking about when, I'm, when I say three-body dynamics. So as I told before, the type of systems that I'm looking at, they look like this. We have two orbits and two Keplerian orbits. And the three-body dynamics here manifest itself as a perturbation on those two orbits. 
So it's an interaction, it's a torque that the two orbits act uh, upon one another. Now, in reality, that means that that interaction is quantified by a set of differential equations. And I can either go through every term uh, in these equations, uh, which is awful to do. And so I decided to use a different technique. And for this, I brought a tool and it's a very highly technologically advanced tool. And to do that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. There we go. I think you can see me now, if not, then say a word, Jim. Yeah, we <laughs> Perfect. So this tool looks like this. So in orange here, you see the inner binary. Inner binary. And in blue, you see the outer binary. This little white line here, you're not seeing that. That's just for me, because otherwise this whole thing is going to fall out of my hands. So, of course, this is absolutely not to scale, right? The blue orbit should be much bigger for the system to be stable, or you get the drift. So what's happening in these three body dynamics, or at least the lowest order of approximation, is that this inner binary goes through these cycles in which the inclination changes. So the inclination goes up and down. At the same time as this inclination changes, the eccentricity of that inner binary changes as well. So we're more circular here, less circular as we go up, more, uh, yeah, more circular, more eccentric, more circular, etc. So we go up and down, up and down in these cycles. So I'll just go back to my slides now. There we go. And share screen. Yes. Okay. I presume you can see my slides again. If not, then okay. I see Jim nodding, so that's good. Okay, so these these cycles that I was talking about, they're they're called the cosi leadoff cycles, uh, better leadoff cosi cycles, um, and they are the lowest order of approximation. So there's higher order effects uh, as well, and in those higher order effects, we just get more extreme behavior. We get more extreme eccentricities. And the inclination can change so much that the inner orbit changes its, uh, its orientation. Now to show it in a bit more quantified way, I, um, I'm showing here the eccentricity and the inclination just for one particular system as a function of time. And the red here is just in the case that that inner binary was isolated. Now we just have two stars, so nothing much happens. And now if we add a third star to it, we get this really strong cycles. And you can see the eccentricity can go up, in this case, to 0.9, and can even go higher, especially with these higher order effects. Now, the thing that I want to point out here with the time scales is that the time scale of this effect um, can vary a lot. Uh, it really depends on this ratio of the periods. So if you want to have a bit of a finger feeling for how long these cycles are, then it's roughly the ratio of the periods times the outer period. So if we have an, a wide outer orbit, then also the time scale of this effect can be up to the years. And if you have a compact system, it can be very short as well. Okay. So the reason why I care about these eccentricity cycles is the following. And I'm gonna show that here uh, with an example again. So what you see here is I'm gonna take a binary again and then add a third star to it. So here you see the orbital separation of a binary as a function of time. And this binary starts out pretty wide. And so nothing much happens to it. Stars just lose a little bit of mass and their stellar winds and that's it. Now, if I put a third star around it, something very different happens. So in this case, if I zoom in, then you will see that during that initial phase, there are these very strong eccentricity cycles. And at some point, the eccentricity becomes so large that there will be mass transfer between the two stars. Now, in this case, it's an unstable phase of mass transfer. It's a common envelope phase. And so the orbit shrinks. A little bit later, the, the inner binary continues evolving. There's another mass transfer phase and eventually even a merger of the two stars in that inner binary. Now, this one, this system in particular, is really cool 
because that merger is between two massive carbon oxygen white doors, which means that this would be something that could give rise to a supernova type 1A. And so it means that I can take a pretty boring white binary that doesn't interact much, and by putting a third star around it, all of a sudden it can, be, can become a supernova type 1A progenitor. So that's, I think that's really cool. Now, the argument that I would make against this, if I would be you, would be like, this is really nice, but you can always come up with one system that does something cool, right? So the question is, how often does this really happen in a full population of triples? Now, in order to do that, uh, we simulated a large population of uh, triples. We made different models for their initial characteristics, different masses, different periods, just to gauge what is the typical evolution of a triple system. So we found that in about three quarters of all the cases, there will be mass transfer in the system. Now, that's a nice number, but it means more if I compare it with isolated binaries. Because isolated binaries in the same mass range, they will only interact in about a quarter to a third of all systems. So mass transfer is about two to three times more likely to happen or more often it will happen in a triple population compared to a binary, uh, binary population. Right, so mass transfer we like because that's usually what leads to observable phenomena, right? That leads to uh, accretion, to more compact systems, to you know, compact objects that finally can merge with, the, with one another. So this is why mass transfer is so, um, uh, such an important uh, uh, thing, event here. Now there's a couple of things that are different between the mass transfer and the triple compared to binaries. And that is that in, in triples, very often when the mass transfer happens, the orbits are still significantly eccentric. So in my full population, it's actually roughly half of all systems. And that is something that we would not expect to happen in a binary population. There we pretty much assume that for the majority of the sources, their orbits completely synchronize and circularize before a star fills the far slope, just before the star fills the far slope. And this is no longer the case in, uh, in triples. Now there's also a number of other outcomes. Um, one is that a secondary star, so your lower mass star in the inner binary, that starts transferring mass to the primary before the primary ever does that. Again, that's something that you wouldn't expect in a regular binary. Um, because the, the primary is more massive, it's larger, it, it would evolve first. So in this case, when that secondary donates mass, it's actually to an evolved star, to a compact object, to a white dwarf in this case, because that's the mass range that I'm looking at. Um, another outcome is that the tertiary star actually starts donating mass, donating mass to the inner binary. And here you see a hydrodynamical simulation uh, of that. And there's some really cool work from Simon Portugui Swart and Nathan Lee, who realized that in a good fraction of these systems, roughly, roughly half of all the cases where, uh, where I get a tertiary that fills the transverse mass to an inner binary, that inner binary is compact enough so that a circumbinary disk can form. Now, if you have a binary with a circumbinary disk, then the lowest mass object has the most amount of angular momentum, comes closest to the disk, and therefore would accrete most. So you would have preferential uh, accretion to your lowest mass object. So what you would expect from these sources is that the masses of the inner binary equalize. So it's a very cool um, observational prediction. And there actually is a twin blue straggler uh, observed, which is really hard to explain in any other way. So I find that this happens for my triple populations in roughly 1% of all triples, of all triples, right? And that's consistent actually with, uh, with the catalog of uh, observed triples from, uh, from Andre Tukovini. Now together with Nathan Lee, we followed up on this and we tried to see how often, or we tried to guess or calculate how often mass transfer from the tertiary happens not only for main sequence binaries, 
which is what my simulations were for. But we were trying to push it to see how often that happens if you have a compact object in the inner binary. And the rate actually for that uh, goes up. So it's uh, several percent of all, cis of all double wide doors where we would expect uh, a tertiary to start donating mass. Now, other outcomes are systems that become dynamically unstable. And I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. And then um, there's also a fraction of systems, about 20 to 30%. So that's the largest group that will not have any mass transfer. So these are systems that are wide enough that there's no physical interaction. Now, interestingly enough, in the last data release of Gaia, we found the first of such systems. So this is a triple white dwarf uh, in which both orbits are resolved. And it's just really nice to see a confirmation that these triples can be stable for such long time scales and survive all of the, the mass loss that these stars go through on their way to become a white dwarf. Now for, oh, I've realized that I did not uh, fix this slide, but one thing that is correct on this slide is that I'm going to go to the last part of my talk, and that is connecting the triples back to transients. So when I come to this part of the talk, I always feel a little bit like I've been trying to paint this picture of triple evolution and very elegant dynamics, but the best thing to do is destroy it all. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to destroy the triples. by having mergers and collisions of the stars. Now, one very efficient way of doing that is by having these systems evolve from one dynamical regime to another dynamical regime. So remember that so far I've been talking about these systems in which we have two Keplerian orbits. But one thing that really makes the number of mergers and collisions go up is if these systems make the transition to more dynamical evolution. Oh, okay. Let's try that again. There we go. So the kind of interactions that I'm thinking about are these interactions that we often see in, uh, in clusters. So this is a little movie made by Carl Rodriguez that shows an inner binary where a third star is being shot at. And you can see that in this case, clearly we don't have two Keplerian orbits anymore. The uh, orbital evolution is very chaotic, very beautiful looking, right? Much more interesting than those two orbits that I show on the left. And in the majority of cases of these kind of systems, we eventually end up with a binary and a single star. So we don't, we don't keep the triple intact, but the system breaks up in, uh, in a binary and, and a single star. But during all of this very chaotic behavior, um, we can form inner binaries that are much more compact than, uh, than we had previously. Or we can also have physical interactions between the stars, such as collisions. There we go. So this happens in, uh, so this systems that make this transition from this very hierarchical regime towards less hierarchical regimes that happens in several percents of, uh, of my triples. So, yeah. So the reason that these systems become unstable is their own internal evolution. It's the fact that these stars lose mass in their stellar winds, that they evolve, that they interact. And, um, yeah, so it's just the fact that from their own stellar winds, the, in, the orbits widen a little bit. And if the inner orbit becomes, if it approaches the size of the outer orbit, then the systems become less hierarchical, they become less stable, and they cross that boundary of stability and into that regime of the movie that I showed before. Now, the percentages that I showed of, you know, a few percent of all triples doing this, if I translate that to the Milky Way, then you get a rate of about one to two per thousand years. And a fraction of those will actually undergo a collision. So a full frontal collision between the two stars in those interactions. And that is cool because 
that is something that you wouldn't expect to happen in binary evolution again. So normally when we think about collisions, we think about cluster environments. So triples, as far as we know now, would actually be the uh, dominant way of getting stellar collisions in the field. Now I wanna make a very quick um, compare, well not comparison, but wanna make a distinction between stellar collisions and stellar mergers. Because I feel especially in uh, like popular literature, sometimes the two terms are used through one another. But what I mean with a stellar collision is really a full frontal um, collision between the two stars, where a merger is a much slower progress where the orbit slowly decays uh, until one of the stars fills its rush slope um, and is where one or both objects are then torn apart from, uh, from tidal effects. Now, the number of, uh, of mergers, well, these stellar mergers uh, that can happen in binaries, I think they're very interesting as well. We've done some work on that as well. Um, and there's just a couple of things I wanna mention about them because these stellar mergers, I think are very interesting for transient studies as well. The transients that come out of them, we often call them luminous red novae or intermediate luminosity optical transients. We have a handful of, uh, of those systems and the rate of those events from um, observational estimates is about one per 10 years, right? So if you compare that to supernovae that happen about one every 100 years in the Milky Way, it means that these are actually 10 times more likely. So they actually happen quite a lot, these stellar mergers. And for my perspective, that means that also likely there is many stellar remnants um, or many stars that actually are remnants of these merger events. And we tried to estimate this for white dwarfs and we found that actually from a theoretical point of view, 10 to 30% of single white dwarfs would come from a merger. And I think the reason why that matters is because white dwarfs are often used to measure ages of stellar environments. And if 10 to 30% of our white dwarfs actually come from mergers, and you assume it always was a single star, you're gonna make a mistake in their ages. So that's something, if you're interested in that, check out the Tamik and, uh, and Tony paper for 2019 where we try to uh, um, estimate this. Okay, I'm going back to the triples and the ones that become dynamically unstable because besides stellar winds, they can also become unstable from their own supernova kicks. And when I talk about supernova kicks, I'm starting to talk about more massive stars and that brings me to gravitational wave sources. So the channel that I'm considering here, they, it looks like this. So I start with three stars, three massive stars. Those massive stars evolve to black holes. Uh, so they lose mass, they undergo the supernova kick. And as they do so, eventually we get a triple black hole and that system has moved to one of those dynamical regimes that have those more, um, that reach those higher eccentricities, right? The ones that you saw uh, in the little movie. Now, during those interactions or something, um, I should phrase this uh, more carefully. So this is a system that starts making that transition towards the more dynamical regime. They don't become completely dynamically unstable. They actually become uh, semi-secular, semi-quasi-stable. And in those interactions, um, the inner binary reaches very high eccentricities. They can, the stars come very close to each other, they wrap each other in a very compact orbit. And then later on, that compact orbit slowly starts shrinking bec because of gravitational waves and eventually leads to the merger. Now, those systems, we can estimate the rate of that. And we found the rate of about one per year per gigaparsec cubed at solar metallicities. And the rate goes up as expected uh, at lower metallicities. So we get a rate of several events per year per gigaparsec cubed. Now, if you compare that to the latest uh, LIGO rate, then you will see that that is several percent, 10 per percent. Uh, at best, we actually reach the lower limit of, uh, of LIGO. So I think that's very interesting that maybe in the current catalog, one of the sources could have come through a Trigis channel and definitely in the, in the next uh, data releases, there should be systems uh, that come through this. 
Now, of course, triples is not the only way that we can form a gravitational wave source. The two typical channels that uh, are often considered is isolated binary evolution or processes that occur in very dense environments, so dynamical processes. And the point I want to make is that the triples are really in between, right? They have some things in common with the binaries, the stellar evolution, the mass transfer, the interactions, and they have some things in common with the dynamical processes in, uh, in clusters as well. Um, I'm going to skip these two slides because of time. But the point that I want to make as well on this slide is that the channel that you've seen so far, that's only one channel of triple evolution, right? And there's so many more channels that we have that we should investigate and that we are going to that my group is going to investigate in the next coming years uh, especially the ones that undergo mass transfer right those are the ones that you have not seen in the previous channel yet and there's so much room for that and especially because massive stars are so typically found in triples more often than binaries i think it's really interesting to look how they evolve differently now I'm gonna show you one project that we did very recently that does involve interacting uh, systems, interacting triples. And I just wanna show the potential that triples have here. And the potential in particular for this case is related to the mass gap. So I'm, I'm sure many of you know what the mass gap is for just for those that, uh, that do not. Very quickly, I'll say it's a gap that we see in the distribution of black hole masses. So the fact that based on theory and also in observations from LIGO, we see a lack of sources um, with very massive black holes, so more massive than about 40 to 50 solar masses. And the reason or what this is linked to is to pair instability supernovae. And the reason is that if you look at single stars, we don't expect them to form very massive black holes, so more massive than 40 to 50 solar masses. The reason is that these very massive stars, they have very dense and very warm cores at the end of their lives. And those cores are unstable to electron positron pair formation, which takes away some of the photon energy, which makes the star collapse and eventually uh, explode. Now, interesting enough, I'm sure many of you have seen this, in the last data release of, um, uh, of LIGO, there was one event that was very far beyond the boundary where most models expect uh, the, the mass gap to happen. Now, of course, one way to form this is by having, black, by having multiple black holes merge with one another, then we could you know, form more massive black holes. And typically people, uh, consider that to happen in stellar clusters, right? There's so many papers that, um, uh, that have looked into this, but we can also do it in triples. And so I want to just show you quickly one, one channel that we uh, consider for this. And in this channel, we start with three stars in an orbit. Uh, the stars evolve into black holes. Eventually the inner two stars merge forms a new single black hole, and uh, eventually the two black holes merge into one very massive black hole. Now, for order, in order for this to happen, both orbits need to be relatively compact. The triple needs to be dynamically stable at birth and throughout its evolution. And for that to happen, it really helps to be at low metallicity, because then we have less mass loss, less orbital change, less natal kicks that just help to keep the system intact. And one other thing that really happen, uh, that really helps is that for these, because this inner orbit is so compact, it means the stars are very heavily rotating, which means that these stars can actually undergo chemically homogeneous evolution, something that we often hear about just for isolated binary evolution. Now the nice thing or the, the interesting characteristic of those stars is that their radii do not grow much in time. So that inner orbit therefore can remain so compact. Especially if they're in contact, then the final black holes that come out are very similar in mass, which helps to reduce our recoil kick when the two black holes merge. 
um, because their spins are then very similar as well, it helps to reduce the, um, the gravitational wave mass loss kick. So this all in all really helps to keep uh, the system intact and therefore to have this sequential merger to happen. Um, I want to show you one quick thing that we did in this paper. Um, and that is we try to estimate what the characteristics of the sources would be that come through this channel. So that's what I want to show you in this diagram. And you see the mass of the outer black hole on the y-axis and the mass of, you know, the total mass of the inner binary black holes on the uh, x-axis. Now there's some part of this diagram I marked out because in that part, you know, no black holes can exist because that's exactly the mass gap. Now, every other part of this diagram, potentially uh, a triple could exist or a triple could exist in every part of the white part of this diagram. Now, I'm going to color code that specific part where we can have a triple that leads to a source in the mass gap. And that's this. And the color coding corresponds to the, um, the effective spin that, um, that LIGO would observe for this source. Now, I have to say that we assumed here that the black holes are formed with low spins. And this is then the, the chi effective distribution that comes out from that. So I think we, we can discuss more whether or not that's uh, the best assumption for these stars. But that's a simple assumption that we made here. Now, if we overplot the uh, mass gap event, so uh, gravitational wave 1905-21, then that one doesn't really seem to match what we would expect very well, um, because the chi effective is fairly low, the spins of those two black holes is relatively high, it doesn't really match well. On the other hand, uh, 170729, which is the most massive event from the previous um, uh, observing run of, uh, from LIGO, that one seems to actually match with uh, our expectations very well. So I think it's interesting that this source potentially could be formed from such a sequential merger. Now, I'm going to go very quickly to um, the last part of my talk, which is supernova type 1a. I'm going to take uh, a few minutes for this. So I'm going to probably run until 10 to um, that's probably fine, Jim. Otherwise, just cut me off. Perfect. Yes. So I want to take you back to this channel that we were talking about before, where we start with three very white, uh, with three stars and a triple, where both orbits are relatively white, and where the system makes that transition to a more dynamical evolution. And this time, we're not going to do that with massive stars. We're going to do it with intermediate mass stars. So we're going to get white dwarfs in that system. And now I'm only interested in those systems that reach an extremely high eccentricity in that inner binary so that the two white dwarfs actually can undergo a collision with one another. Now, the reason why that is interesting is because of supernova type 1a. Supernova type 1a is something, are, are events that need very little introduction in astronomy. Uh, but I'll just mention that they're one of the brightest cosmic explosions that we know in the universe. Uh, they have an incredibly important role in astronomy because we use them to measure distances. But one of the very big problems is that we still do not understand what their progenitors are. So there's a consensus that a type 1a is a thermonuclear explosion of a carbon oxygen white dwarf. But the big question is, how do you get a white dwarf to explode? So classically, we had two different ways. So on the left, you see a white dwarf that's accreting mass from a companion star. And when it reaches the Chandrasekhar mass, it will explode. On the right, you see a double white dwarf. And if these two double white dwarfs merge and the total mass is above Chandrasekhar, then again, the type 1a explosion uh, would occur. Now I have to say there's many other channels uh, the, the last few years has been a lot of work on this. Many more channels have been proposed that are either extensions of this or mixes of the two channels or completely new channels. But I just want to mention one, and that is the one that's related to white dwarf collisions. And the one really nice thing about 
this channel is that the um, ignition mechanism of the explosion is well understood because that's from the shock. Where in the case of the other two channels, it's something that we have to put in by hand. So this is one really nice aspect. Um, yeah, so the thing that my simulations then can do is try to estimate what the rates are for these channels. And the rates for supernova type 1a are usually given in a very funny unit. And this unit is 10 to the minus 4 per solar masses. So what this means is if you have a group of stars on the sky with a total mass of 10,000 solar masses, then how many events happen in a Hubble time? Now, from observations, we know that that is about 11. If we calculate the rate from the single degenerate channel from a theoretical perspective, so by, by modeling binary evolution, then the rate that we find is about one. And I would consider this an upper limit uh, because this is for very optimistic, the most optimistic assumptions for how efficiently a white dwarf can grow in mass and any other assumptions that I make um, really reduces the, uh, the rate by, by three orders of magnitude. Uh, so have a look at Boris Tone at all if you find that interesting. So for double degenerates, the rate that I'm finding is about two to five, which is better, right? It's a little bit on the low side. Um, it's not extreme offset, but still not super comfortable. So what can triples do here? Unfortunately, the rate that I'm finding is at least three orders of magnitude lower. And the reason for this is just simply that, you know, in order for these very extreme eccentricities to happen, there's a very small range in inclinations that you need to be at. And if a system is born with those characteristics, then very often they interact, they get those very high eccentricities a long time before we have white dwarfs. So this is why I just get very few of those uh, sources. I had one more slide telling you about the accuracy of these numbers, uh, because we do a lot of work trying to calibrate the numbers that we're predicting, comparing that with observational samples. Unfortunately, I don't have time to show that. But for double degenerates, for example, for double white dwarfs, for example, my space density estimates are um, exactly spot on with observations. There's of course a range of, um, of space densities. Well, there's an error in the observed space densities and we're exactly in the middle there. So um, I think there at least, I don't expect to be off by uh, an order of magnitudes. Um, I'll go a little bit longer and go super quick over this because I just wanna show you this new channel that we've been working on. Uh, because if triples cannot solve it, what can we do then? And I think the supernova type 1a rate is so high that whatever needs to happen, needs to happen very efficiently. And so that leads me to binaries. So I'm going to end this talk by talking about binaries and not triples. And the thing that I've been working on together with a guy, Beretz and Joseph Senati, is to look at mergers of white dwarfs when one of the stars is a hybrid white dwarf. So a hybrid white dwarf is a white dwarf with a CO core and a very thick helium layer. You can see in this graph that it can be up to about a quarter of the total mass. So about 0.1 solar masses of, of helium in these white dwarfs. And we form them very, very natural in a binary. If, you, if it interacts with a companion star, you strip off the hydrogen envelope and you're just left with a helium star. Very low helium stars um, will just become these hybrid white dwarfs. They don't experience very strong winds so or there's nothing that removes that, uh, that helium envelope. Now the simulations that uh, Joseph has done with flash of these mergers, they show that, well, here's a slice through that. So uh, we assume that the hybrid is disrupted, forms an accretion disk around the uh, central white dwarf. Uh, here you see the, the central white dwarf, and this is a, a cut through through the disk. And you see that as mass flows towards the, uh, the central white dwarf, a, a layer accumulates on top of that white dwarf. And when that layer detonates, it sends a shock wave into the central white dwarf 
compresses the core and uh, which then sets off the explosion. So it's it's kind of a double detonation mechanism for uh, for people that are familiar with that term. And what really helps here is that there's helium in the system because that makes it much easier for that layer to detonate. And that was already realized previously, but what this channel really brings is a very natural way of why there will be so much helium in, uh, in the system in the first place. The spectra that we get out um, look very beautiful. They compare very nicely with observations here. Um, in red and orange, you see um, the, the spectra of 2011 FE at two different moments and just overlaid two of our models. It's not a fit, uh, but you see that it already really reproduces the, uh, the main characteristics of the spectrum quite nicely. The light curves uh, also reproduce the main uh, features going very quickly before Jim uh, <laughs> kicks me off. But I just wanna mention that we are reproducing not only like the main supernova type 1A, so the events over here, so our models are in blue, but we're also reproducing some of the supernova type 1A likes. So not the main, not the regular uh, supernova type 1A, but for example, the calcium rich transients. I'll just show you one spectrum that we have for that. Here in blue, you see 2005E, and in red, one of our models uh, that look like, uh, like one of these calcium-rich transients. And what is different in this model is that it's not the hybrid white dwarf that's disrupted, but it's the other white dwarf that's disrupted. Uh, and so the hybrid is the central one that, uh, uh, that ignites and that accretes. Last thing is uh, the rates for this channel are much higher. So about 25 to 30% of all the double white dwarf mergers in my models are mergers that with a hybrid star, with a hybrid white dwarf. And observationally, we only need 15% of the double white dwarf uh, merger rate to lead to a supernova type 1A. So this is the first channel that very comfortably reaches the supernova type 1A rate. Now, that is bringing me to really my final slides, the summary slide, where I want to say that I'm really, really excited to, you know, about the next era, because really my field is driven by observations. And, you know, there's so much coming on the transient side, which is, is a really cool time for me to start looking in, you know, all the weird evolutions that these systems can go through. We now have a code to model the evolution of triples. We've seen that triples can be dominant for many different types of transients, for collisions, for gravitational wave sources. Um, I'll also very honestly tell you if I think that, you know, a triple might not solve everything, such as the supernova type 1A progenitor problem, but therefore we have a different channel um, that, uh, that considers hybrid white dwarfs. And then I'll leave you with the very last slide, which is the um, link to my website, where you'll find the link to the GitHub with the code uh, you'll find some information about the Facebook group on triples, if you find triples interesting, and also a link to this web interface that we made. So if you observe a triple, you can just plug it in there and you can see what kind of dynamics is important to that system. So that is really all that I wanted to say today. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. That was an amazing talk. A lot of results there. Luckily, we have time for some questions. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Okay, it looks like we have Viraj. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, my question was about the massive star collisions from these triples. So uh, you spoke about how the rate of these collisions compares to the rate of stellar mergers. I was curious to know if there's an understanding of what the observable signatures of such collisions would be and how they compare to those of uh, stellar mergers? Yeah, so um, so typically the um, so we're talking now about uh, collisions and mergers of uh, just stars, right? So not compact objects, just regular stars. Okay. Um, typically, the the most common collisions occur in clusters, and then it's collisions between two main sequence stars. In this case, because um, 
the collisions occur because the triple becomes unstable and it becomes unstable because of stellar winds. Mm -hmm. It means that the stars that are involved are stars that are experiencing strong winds. And so the, the typical collision here occurs between, you know, an AGB star between an evolved giant and a main sequence companion. So that would be one of the, the you know, things that makes the, uh, the observables very different. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up, Ilaria. Uh, yes, Hi, hello, uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about, uh, um, at some point you mentioned that 10 to 30% of white dwarfs might be the result of mergers. And so my question is like, is that a merger in the white dwarf state or are those white mergers that happen during the main sequence? I am going to show you a slide. Um, oh. Okay. Can you see this slide? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So that's exactly the work that uh, that Carol Tamming did. And here you see, if I go to the previous, yeah. So. I'll just go to the previous slide. So here you see which stars were involved in that merger that eventually lead to a single white dwarf. So you see that double white dwarfs are about 10% of all of the mergers, but the most typical one is actually between a star on the first giant branch with a main sequence. So when that merger happens, you don't immediately get a white dwarf, right? We get a giant out, but that giant evolves further and then eventually becomes a white dwarf. The next slide would just show you this for, you know, if we make different assumptions about the binary evolution, the exact distribution, you know, changes a little bit, but the overall trend is, uh, um, you know, that double white doors is not the main, main type of, uh, of merger. Yeah. And, and so just a small follow-up question, like, do you find uh, a long delay, uh, since you mentioned like they're used for, uh, um, aging a population. So you do find a time, a big time delays in these mergers. I, I guess you find different time delays in different uh, scenarios. Yeah, exactly. So the time delay is the largest for the double white dwarf mergers. Um, so maybe this helps. So this is the plot uh, that, uh, that answers that question. So on the y axis, you see the time difference. So if you observe a single white dwarf, you would guess its age but actually it would have been a merger, how wrong would you be? That's what it says here on this axis. And it can be up to several giga years, but for the majority of sources, it's not that much. So for the majority, it's of the order of um, um, 50 to 500 mega years. So overall the mergers take, so mergers can take longer. They can also, uh, yeah, single stars can form quicker. Let's phrase this correctly. So a merger can take longer to form a white dwarf than a single binary. It can also be the other way around. But on average, they take longer by about one and a half to five times. Thank you. Okay, next is Tony. Hi, Professor, thanks so much for your, for your wonderful talk. Um, my question is about how sensitive are, how sensitive is triple star evolution to initial conditions? And if you have constraints from like star formation, like massive star formation or multiple star formation and how that's been able to help you from the, from the theoretical side of, of things. That's a very good question. So for binaries, right? This is always one of the things that we need to take into account why we make different models with different assumptions about these initial distributions. And that's the same for triples, right? So I showed you these percentages of, you know, the outcomes. The reason why I had those ranges is for, you know, because I made different assumptions about the initial distributions. Now we do have constraints. Um, uh, and of course, as you can imagine, the constraints on binaries are better than for triples because we just have more observations. But the one really cool thing for triples is that it is actually less important for triples than for binaries. And the reason is that if you, for these triples, we need to fit two orbits 
within about 10 to the 6 of the AEI. If we're wider than that, then the binary would dissolve just by interactions with interloper stars or from the galactic tidal field. So that's the maximum amount of room that we have. So if we want to fit two binaries in there, your, so what the observations show is that um, it's how we best can describe them is to draw both orbits from the same distribution and then just throw away out those orbits that are dynamically unstable. That means that the inner orbits are a bit biased towards shorter and the outer ones are a bit biased towards outer orbits. But it also means that if I make different assumptions about that initial distribution, and I've played around with this, I end up with more or less similar inner and outer orbits. So even if I start drawing from a, from a different distribution, because I throw away all the unstable ones, the distribution, the final triple orbits become more similar. So that's really one thing that's very nice because there's more parameters, right? More masses, more orbits. So this is a, a very lucky coincidence. I see. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much. 2020 paper because then you can show up, then you can see how they, uh, they change. Okay, thanks. And I want to give I want to give Wen Ben a chance to ask the last question. Thanks so much, both of you. Uh, so I want to ask about type 1a from collisions in triples. So there was, a, we heard one more earlier colloquium from uh, Subodon and uh, he, you know, his model with boy cats. They're saying those uh, collisions actually can, the rates can be comparable to the type 1a rate, which you, I, I would say you don't believe. So the thing is their model, they claim their model is supported by those uh, double peaked lines. They found that a large fraction of those uh, uh, of type 1a, normal type 1a is actually they have in the nebula phase, they have uh, double peaked lines. I guess in your scenario, in this uh, hybrid merger scenario, would you also get uh, those uh, double peak lines? I guess in the like accretion disk scenario, you may get bipolar outflows. Would, is that correct? That's a very good question. And we haven't looked at the very long time scales yet. So that's something that we should uh, definitely do. Regarding the numbers. Yeah, the rate. What, what was the key difference between yours and their calculation on the rate? Um, yeah, so my calculations are done with modeling the full triple evolution, taking into account all the stellar effect, all the stellar evolution effects mm -hmm. and the three at the same time um, so that's something that they had to you know approximate so I think that is one of uh, one of the differences and I would say yeah I'll, I'll just go to this yeah no, it will take too much time but so what I, I really try to do with the models is compare them to observed space densities as much as I can and so for my binary models I know that they're calibrated very well for the triples you know, we, we are, it's very new. So we're starting to do that. The samples, the observational samples still need to grow as well. But what I do know is that if I look at the number of white, double white dwarfs, so they are the one that leads to these collisions. If I look at them, then, um, okay, I'll, <laughs> make the story longer. So in, in within 20 parsec, we have a really nice sample of white dwarfs that is 95 to 90% complete. And in that sample, there are only two white double white dwarfs. Now, just from binary evolution, you would expect an order of magnitude more. So something is happening that either these very wide double wide doors are not formed or they are destroyed for some reason. And they are so wide that they're resolved uh, and they're so wide that they've never had mass transfer. So, you know, ties are not important. Common envelopes are not important. Nothing, nothing of that is important. And so I would almost say that my numbers um, are still for, you know, that order of magnitude overestimation of the, the number of total wide double white doors. So double white double white doors, this is where the models uh, do not agree well. So I would guess that my best estimate for 
how many of these white systems lead to a collision, I, I would consider my number even an upper limit based on that comparison with observations. So of course we need more observations, but. Uh, yeah, I see. Thanks. I think, yeah, it's more calibrated than their, I would say more hand waving and then their assumptions. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot more to discuss, but we're out of time, so we have to leave it there. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and let's thank Sylvia again. And faculty, please stick around for the meet and greet.